Hello and welcome back to Inside the Markets with Globe. I'm your host Sunlight and today I'm delighted to welcome back to the show Justin Danathan, Head of Business Development APAC at Keyrock. So watch on to find out about his thoughts and commentary on the markets. Uh, so welcome back to the show, Justin. Um, so last time you were here, you were sales director at Amber Group, but now you're at Key Rock. Could you tell us a bit about your, you know, your new role? Sure, absolutely. So I'm managing business development and partnerships for APAC, so for the Asia region, for Key Rock. Uh, Key Rock is a crypto market maker, so we're providing liquidity on a variety of exchanges, about 85 different venues. And we're also market making for a lot of token projects that are you know, traded on those venues or about to get listed on those venues uh, to make sure that the launch is successful. And on top of that, we have uh, an OTC desk. Uh, we also have a treasury management desk and we have a very small venture arm for some of the projects where you know, we wanna get uh, a bit more involved. With that being said, I'll use the opportunity to say that anything we're going to talk about today is really just my views. Uh, so it doesn't reflect at all on what uh, Key Rock does. If anything, as a market maker, you're always market neutral. So by definition, you're on either side of the trade and you have absolutely no market view. So maybe what we're going to be discussing about is the insights and the comments I get from just having looked at markets for quite a long time now, about six, seven years, the, you know, looking at crypto markets and also just the discussions I have with so many different players on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. A lot, a lot has happened since then. And, you know, even since, you know, the start of 2024, actually, there's been some huge news. I'm sure, <laughs> yeah, everyone's heard about, you know, the ETF launches. So could you tell us a thought, your thoughts on the price action as a result of these ETFs? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think first, even maybe before getting into that, it's good to understand the people that were trading crypto just before the ETF launch, because you had essentially two different cohorts that traded that news. Um, Pre-ETF listing, I think they were very crypto native people. So people like you and I, uh, maybe also some sophisticated investors that were already active in crypto markets and, and looking at things. And if you know that an ETF is coming, you start to trade on the probability that it will get approved, right? Because ETF talks have been going on for years, like probably as long as you and I have been in, in markets. Um, but I feel like end of 2023, it really felt like it was going to happen. You know, we we're hearing names like the BlackRock, the Fidelity, the PIMCO, the Invesco, and so on. We're kind of thinking, okay, there's some real institutions looking at crypto and chances are if they're looking at it, it's because something's going to happen. But Ironically, I think that those people that were trading, buying the rumor, were definitely planning on selling the news the moment it would happen, right? And I don't know if you remember the time when the ETFs did get approved, but actually the prices of Bitcoin even retraced just a little bit. And for me, that was just people taking profit. So they traded that narrative of ETF are going to come. Now we've, you know, we've done that trade, we get out of the market and we move on to the next trade, which might be trading Solana or going to NFT or whatever it is, right? But then you had a second cohort that got into markets and started trading that as well, which is first the people that were trading the uh, ETF itself. Sorry for that little uh, <laughs> thumb up, inadvertent uh, thumb up. And the second co cohort were people that were genuinely bullish on crypto and felt like that kind of vindicated their view, right? And so I, I, I think we've been talking about this ETF for way too long. I think you and I and probably the audience are tired of hearing, you know, talks about the ETF. But the truth is, it's a momentous thing, right? It's, it's something absolutely huge. And it's also kind of mind boggling to think that Bitcoin doesn't have a CEO, doesn't have a marketing team, doesn't have VC backing, you know, to get it started. It literally just came out of some crypto punks uh, sharing it online OTC for a while and then going into exchanges. And now there's an ETF that is provided by some of the largest asset managers in the US for people to get exposure to it, right? And that just can't be understated. And so a lot of people that were standing on the sidelines, uh, people in traditional finance, traditional investors, people that were still on the fence and thinking that Bitcoin might go to zero or that it's a, a bit of a scam or that it's a Ponzi scheme and so on are thinking, okay, now it feels legit enough that I should allocate, you know, a little bit to it, right? And so I think th those are the people you see. Um, 
and, and so you're going to see a lot of uh, of that capital flowing in. And then the ones I was talking about is also just the crypto people themselves, right? Which are just so bullish and they know that more capital is going to come as a result of all those ETFs. Um, so I think, yeah, it's just going to be very, very interesting to watch. I don't know yeah, if that answers your question in terms of, of all the price action, but yeah. Yeah, no, it does make sense of it more because, you know, like, you know, these huge, this huge news is coming out and, you know, why is the price going down? But yeah, you've, <laughs> you have answered it, but um, speaking more I, about, you know, yeah. N Neta, by the way, can I just add a, another point yeah, just on, on, still on that note is yeah. amongst all the traditional finance people that I was talking about that were, you know, on the fence and, and looking at it. I think the thing that's going to be super interesting is also other stock exchanges that will want to launch other uh, crypto linked ETF, right? So everybody's super excited about that news or was super excited, still is, because it's in the US and it's a spot ETF and not a, a futures based ETF. But I think the fact that now it's been launched, it essentially means that if you're a regulator in Australia, do you have a reason to not allow a crypto ETF? Probably not if the US you know, wants it. Do you have a reason if you're the regulator in, uh, I don't know, Brazil to not have an, e you know, and so all those regulators are looking at the US and being like, okay, if they'll do it, probably we should do it just to stay relevant, right? So yeah, that's it. Sorry, let's go yeah. on. No, no, of course. Yeah. So, I mean, you were talking about the legitimacy that this brings, right? So yes. um, obviously this gives a lot of retail, you know, exposure to crypto, right. But on the flip side, what do you think about, you know, big institutional players? Um, I Well, that's a great question. I, I think there are multiple factors to think about. First, I do think that even those guys look at BlackRock as still a symbol of legitimacy and credibility. Um, but also think something very interesting that's going to play out in 2024 and 2025 is that those big institutional players are going to start comparing notes, basically. And depending on how crypto markets perform, some of the guys that did allocate to crypto will perform a lot better than the ones that didn't. That becomes a bit of an awkward situation for the institutional guys that did not allocate to Bitcoin to then explain to their investor base or their, you know, their clientele, essentially, why we didn't even allocate 1%, 2%, 3%, which doesn't sound like a massive amount, but when you're talking about large institutional player, 2% is a lot of money, right? And so I think that node comparing thing is very silly because when you think about uh, sophisticated investors, you think that they all have their strong opinions and their strong ego. But the truth is sometimes they're like school kids, you know, looking at their um, neighbor to try to get to see the answer, right? And so when they see that a lot of people are allocating to crypto, they're going to want to stay relevant. They're going to want to stay competitive. And so they're going to start allocating to it. So I think institutional players are definitely going to be playing catch up here. And then another side of this is, I think there were a lot of institutional players pre ETFs that did want to get exposure to crypto because they like the narrative or they understand that the markets are liquid enough or because it's uncorrelated over a long enough period of time, but they couldn't get exposure because of the operational hassle. And that's something that people in crypto often forget is like, you know, you and I are very comfortable with our MetaMask. We've got a nano ledger, uh, you know, to get to keep our Bitcoin safe from everything. If you're an institutional player, you can't do that, right? You need a different type of setup and it's very cumbersome. It also has a cost and it gives you a, a certain feeling of insecurity. I think the ETF just simplifies all of that. And as easily as you were buying Amazon stocks or Microsoft stocks, you can now buy Bitcoin ETF and maybe in the future, you know, some other ETFs. And that's just going to mean more capital coming in again. You know. Yeah, awesome. So, I mean, speaking to like the rest of the year, I mean, people will stop trading off the news of the ETFs now. But what do you think about the impact it will have on price action? Yeah, so, I mean, hopefully later on we can talk about different factors, you know, affecting the, the macroeconomic picture, you know, that would be driving uh, crypto markets. But if we're still talking in the context of an ETF, I still think it's just, you know, legitimately bullish um, because maybe another dynamic you're going to see happen is a lot of people that offer trading instruments will now be offering the Bitcoin ETF. So it's a, a bit like a, a secondary or one hop away from the actual ETF thing, which is if you think about digital asset managers or online trading platforms and so on, now that you have the ETF available, you have all that user base, all those consumer facing platforms, 
or even high net worth facing um, institution or, or companies that are offering that uh, product. And you already know that a percentage of those people are going to want some kind of, of exposure to it, right? Even if not, most of the people are not convinced, you still have a chunk of those people convinced. So from an ETF perspective, it's just going to keep on, on adding and adding and it becomes a virtuous circle, right? The more people are doing it, the more people think it's okay to do it or they think that they should do it or they have a fear of missing out, which is not always a very positive instinct, but it's still something, um, you, you know, that plays out in people's psyche and just in, in markets in general, right? In the same way that when Tesla goes up and everybody has Tesla, other people want to buy the, the Tesla stock. Um, I, I think also maybe on that point that we're talking about, another thing that will be very interesting and that I hinted at is the arrival of other crypto ETFs. So of course you've got the Bitcoin ETF is the, the most important one, right? If you think about American large investors, when they think about crypto, they think about Bitcoin. I don't even think they think about Ethereum as much as they think about Bitcoin. Um, we might be excited about Ethereum and all the other cryptocurrencies, but for the, the large players, it, it's Bitcoin. That being said, Ethereum is still the number two, you know, in terms of, of market cap, you know, following Bitcoin. And so I think the natural um, thought is, is Ethereum ETF about to come? And if it is, should we start allocating to it? And if it is, are we kind of creating a self-fulfilling prophecy where the Ethereum market is very liquid, it's getting a lot of attention, it has risen. And so a lot of the ETF providers want some kind of uh, ability to capitalize on that. And so some kind of product that they can sell their users. So I think you'll see some Ethereum ETF at some point. I think some people are a bit too excited about it and they say like, oh, it's gonna be one or two months. Might be, might also not be, might, might be like, you know, 12 months out or whatever it is, but regardless, on a long enough time period, it doesn't matter whether it comes in three months or in 12 months or in 18 months, it's still going to be bullish. If I can kind of follow my train of thought even further out, I think after Bitcoin and Ethereum, you, you will face a, a situation where a lot of people will be clamoring for even more crypto ETFs, but maybe the ETF providers will take a step back there or they'll pause. Why? because the markets for the altcoins are a lot less liquid than the one for Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so if you're an ETF provider, you always wanna make sure that you can handle all the flows in and out of your product. And also you wanna make sure that the impact yourself that you have on a given market is not too impactful, basically, right? It's good that it's bullish, but you also don't want to, to rock the markets too much. And so I don't know if beyond Bitcoin and Ethereum, you can see that many other single crypto ETFs, but then the thing that might be very interesting and, uh, and bullish for us is kind of like a, an index, a crypto index ETF, or maybe like a basket of crypto ETF, which is more manageable because then you can kind of uh, spread whatever inflow and outflow across multiple markets. Um, but either way, it, from my perspective, regardless of when it happens, it's more capital coming into the space, which I'm really excited about. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, really interesting because it would just give people another level of exposure. And also, like, maybe if I can be a bit idealistic about, you know, what that can mean for crypto is I think when people have exposure to an asset, they tend to look at it a bit more, not just from a price performance, but they start to look a bit into the company in the same way that if you have, you know, stocks in uh, Bank of America, from, from, you know, as a as a silly example, you'd look a bit more into what's happening at Bank of America, what their balance sheet might be or what performance they have. And I think when people start to hold Bitcoin and it performs either very well or very badly, they'll still look at the asset and start to get familiar with uh, concepts that we hold dear, you know, in our heart, which are decentralization, peer-to-peer -peer transactions, self-custody, cryptography and what it means for, you know, the whole blockchain space and, and how it uh, relates to non-cryptographically secured systems like the traditional financial systems, uh, maybe other solutions, then maybe they have Ethereum, so they start to understand smart contracts. And so, I don't know, there's a part of me that optimistically wants to believe that that will lead to more people caring about decentralization, even though if we're being super honest with ourselves, an ETF is almost like the opposite of what crypto is supposed to be for, right? Because you don't get more centralized than having a provider, you know, uh, feeding you the exposure you want into something that is decentralized. So in, in a way it's silly, but maybe it's just a bridge or a, a phase that we have to go through. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it goes against the whole ethos of it, but um, yes. if it gets more people in it, it does 
do you reckon it outweighs the the implications of that um that's a great question to to be honest i don't know basically <laughs> um i i still would rather people get invested into the crypto space with the right understanding and for the right reasons which would be like closer to the crypto punks ideals th than simply you know number go up but it's always a dance between those two things right because if we're invested into that industry, it's probably because at some point in our lives, we heard about it. And the reason we heard about it is because number go up and people made some money off of it, right? So maybe it wasn't the catalysis or maybe it wasn't the reason, but it was a catalysis. And so I'm hoping that that's the case. Um, but a, another more pessimistic part of me is very worried about what the ETFs mean for Bitcoin and for the crypto ecosystem, because it means a large chunk of the supply being held by centralized entities that, that don't abide by the same philosophical uh, concepts that we have about, you know, a truly open financial system, about decentralization, um, about all the different solutions that can be built on it, right? And so you could imagine even like dark scenarios where if there's ver something very wrong that happens with crypto or regulators cracking down on things, um, that the ETF would actually be like even a, a, it would worsen the situation because you'd have a lot of holders uh, or a centralized entity that can unilaterally uh, do something with the assets. Um, and, and that could really hurt either markets or the asset class as a whole or the credibility in, in some way. So far, I feel like everything seems very positive, but you know, you never know, right? Well, only time would tell. So, right. yeah. And um, so this year, what do you think will be, you know, one of the largest narratives in the in the market driving um, prices? Mm. Can I totally bypass your question in a way and give you more than one, you know, narrative that yeah. are going to drive um, uh, Please markets? Please do, absolutely. Prices? I mean, because the reason why I'm saying that is because first, I think it's really hard to quantify the impact of any single factor over time. And also because I do think that the bigger one, but I don't want to, to sound like repetitive, is, is still the ETF, right? So I think that's by far for 2024 is the thing, right? I, I don't think there's much more that's going to go on. That being said, if you're a trader, and I think that the majority of your audience are like quite active traders and even leveraged traders and so on. I think there's a lot of factors to pay attention to uh, when you're looking at crypto markets. The first one, actually, I'll, I'll divide it maybe between macro and, and then crypto because there's some macro stuff that affects crypto markets and then there's just crypto native stuff that affects crypto markets. On the macro side of things, you've got the interest rate expectations. And it's really funny because I remember that two years ago when I was on your podcast, we already talked about the interest rate expectations, but they were in a very different dynamic than before because people were raising it because they were dealing with all the inflation uh, stuff that was going on. Now I feel like the expectation for most investors is that th there won't be any more uh, rate hikes and even that the rates will be cut. And so what you're seeing, if you're looking at macro markets, say the S&P 500, like the, you know, equity indexes, you see that they're not only very high, but they're even above their all-time high. And that's a factor of people expecting that the rates are going to be cut. But that's very supportive for all risk assets. So it's not just equities, it's also real estate, it's also precious metal, and it's also crypto. So if you can keep track of interest rate expectations, which are changing on a day-to-day -day basis, that's actually going to be very impactful for prices for better or for worse, but it feels right now that it's for the better, not for the worse. The second macroeconomic thing that I'm looking at, and it's going to sound very bleak and negative and dark, but there's a silver lining to it, is that I think there's a lot of geopolitical uncertainty. And I'm, I'm sure you'll understand what, what I mean by that, but you have a lot of different conflicts in a lot of different areas, right? Um, even within countries, you have issues with the fiat currency, with the central banks, with the commercial agreements and so on, right? And so regardless of which side of those conflicts, you know, you would stand, there's still an overarching feeling globally that things don't feel that safe anymore, right? And so that's why I'm saying it's a bit dark, it's a bit negative, but there's a certain distrust in governments, in institutions, in what's happening and how the future is going to play out and how safe investments, you know, might be and so on. And all of that plays out to, to play negatively on markets. But in a, the silver lining that I was alluding to is, I think for crypto, 
as a decentralized asset, there's actually a positive tail to the to that, right? Which is I'm, I'm totally picking on one country out of uh, there's no recent news at all on on that front. But let's say Turkey or Lebanon. You're a citizen of Lebanon or Turkey. Do you feel very safe right now? Do you do you have a of confidence, you know, financially or economically in your uh, currency? Probably not, or probably not as uh, trust trusting and, and safe as an American or a European, right? In, in terms of uh, currency perception, right? And so would it make sense that you would allocate a little bit into crypto? I think a bit more. And so I think the kind of the flip side of all the negative stuff that can happen geopolitically in all those different countries is some kind of... Um, renewed appreciation for the decentralization uh, of crypto. I think the, the other factor, of course, um, relative to macro and crypto is that ETF. I think it sits at, at the middle point between a truly macro unrelated to crypto and the, the totally crypto native because it's that kind of centralized provided um, product, but it is crypto focused and every dollar that goes into a, a Bitcoin ETF at some point gets translated into actual Bitcoin that are being bought. So that's super positive. And so it'll be very interesting to track the inflows and outflows of money into those crypto ETFs because it gives you a hint, right? If you see very large inflows into ETFs, and there are ways to track that on chain, by the way, because it is still on chain. I mean, the purchases of ETFs are actually on chain, so you can actually track it. So you can actually know how much is being bought and sold. If you see large purchases, that should be a hint that something is happening and people are uh, allocating. I'll, I'll stop my rant in, in a minute. So going to the crypto uh, focused indicators, I think the first one, I'm not going to put my thumb up because I don't want an emoji to happen on my screen, yeah. but is the halving. Now, personally, I've always been unsure about that event. I think it's more narrative driven than an actual uh you know, impact in terms of, of course, it limits the supply of, of newly issued Bitcoin, but I don't think it necessarily should affect markets as it does, but people still look at it. And so just in and of its own, it's a narrative that people buy into. But then I do think that in this case for this year, because you've got that mixed feeling of ETFs inflows, and then a reduction of supply by half for all the newly, uh, you know, minted blocks, I think it just creates like such a powerful narrative um, and it solidifies our understanding, I think, of you have an inflationary currency, the US dollar, and then you have a set supply, a hard-coded supply asset like Bitcoin, and then the supply goes down. It always was. So, so for me, again, from my perspective, I think it should be pricing. I don't think it should be that effective, uh, impactful. But you still have all those inflows from the ETF that are buying a supply that is reduced. Yeah, that's a pretty powerful setup, right? It's a bit different than when there's no ETF. You can kind of say, well, there's a halving. All the crypto guys knew there was going to be halving. It should be priced in. The buying should be the same. This year feels a bit different, right? So there's maybe a bit more um, potential for, for upside. The second crypto focused factor that I'm looking at that most people don't think about. Most people have forgotten about it. Do you remember the bankruptcies of 2022? What, so, you like, know, the Celsius. SoftBank and... Oh, well, no. uh, so bank, the, the, I mean, th th those are definitely bankruptcies of 2022. I'm thinking about the crypto one. So like, you know, the Celsius, uh, the yeah. BlockFi, the yeah. Voyager, the Babel, the FTX, mm -hmm. the Genesis. It's a bit horrifying that the list is so long, but there's a lot of bankruptcies that took place in 2022, right? The silver lining in this one is that those bankruptcies take time to get played out. But now it's been two years since then, right? It feels like it was yesterday, at, at least for me, because I'm still traumatized by yeah. how, you know, it kept me up uh, at night, you know, handling clients and stuff. Mm -hmm. But but now those people are going to be paid out. It, it's not going to happen in one go in 2024. It might trickle down in 2024 with Celsius and maybe BlockFi a little bit later and then maybe FTX early 2025. I'm, I'm just making those dates up. I have no idea. But, but the point is, I do know that they're getting paid out slowly and it's going to be around this time, 2024, 2025. Now, the thing that's super interesting is that all the people that are involved in, you know, that would need to get money back from those bankruptcies are by default crypto people, right? So if you were a user of BlockFi or Genesis or uh, or, or Celsius, that you were a crypto user. So it, it doesn't take too much of a stretch to think that the people that were invested in crypto then that are now receiving some number of cents on the dollar, maybe it's 50 cents or 60 cents or 70 cents or 80 cents on the dollar, 
they have capital, they think that crypto markets are doing well and they'll think about reallocating. So I think when those bankruptcies get paid out, and I think they're in the process of being paid out this year, next year, it's going to be yet another funnel or, or fuel of capital that gets back uh, into the crypto space. And now the last, then I'll stop talking and you can ask me another question, but the last <laughs> catalysis that I think will be impactful for crypto market, and that's totally my conspiracy theory, by the way. I'm, it's totally baseless claim. I have no idea if it's going to happen. Not financial advice. <laughs> Not financial advice. Do your own research. Yeah. Views are my own. But <laughs> the, the point is, I think a country will make Bitcoin legal tender at some point in the next 18 to 24 months, basically. So I think El Salvador, which suffered for two years, right, during the bear market, I think a lot of people were looking down on, you know, that the, the country making Bitcoin like a, a legal tender alongside the US dollar. I think it's now kind of winning that bet. Like a lot of people look at it and think it was a respectful decision. It doesn't change much for the, the country, but in terms of the use case and the case study, it's actually useful. I strongly suspect that there will be another country at some point that will follow suit, basically. And there's a lot of reasons why that might be. And we don't have time to get into it. But I do think there's a certain de-dollarization uh, trend going on, right? So people that want to get out of the dollar hegemony or at least want to contemplate substitute. But if it's not the US dollar, what other currency is it? Could it be the euro? Sure. But you you know, the, the US and Europe are so aligned, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Mm -hmm. Is it the Chinese yuan or the, the Russian ruble? Yeah, what do you Is think it, about that, the whole BRICS situation? It's, well, I think from a currency perspective, it's it's really tough and it's been tough for them for a long time because the rates were higher in the US. And as far as we know, for, for, for now, at least the US is kind of the bank of the world. So I think when they raise rates, it, it impacts all those different countries. But... I mean, I think those countries, like the BRICS country, they're big enough to stand on their own and not think about an alternative. But I do think there's a lot of BRICS adjacent countries, meaning smaller emerging countries that are still kind of tied to the dollar and they can't give their allegiance to a specific country with a specific fiat currency. And so I feel like, again, it's a perfect use case or a perfect example of what Bitcoin you know, can serve as, which is it's a currency. It's super liquid, sure. It's super volatile, but on the flip end, flip end of that, it's also totally backed by nobody, basically, and it's still, you know, tradable. And oh, actually, there's a Bitcoin ETF now, so it looks a bit more legit, and so on. Would it make sense to offer that as an alternative? So you still have the US dollar, just like in El Salvador, right? There's still the US dollar as a legal tender, but you, if you want to use Bitcoin, you can also use Bitcoin, and I think that could happen uh, relatively soon. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, last time you were on the show, um, you said roughly 80% of your uh, portfolio was allocated towards Bitcoin and Ethereum. But do you reckon you'll do a bit of portfolio rebalancing now that markets are looking a bit healthier? So uh, the answer, the short answer is no, not at all. But I'll give you a little bit of a caveat and, and a reasoning behind it, right? The, the thing is, I always want to counter trade myself a little bit in the sense that I think people have to hedge against their own stupidity. And by that, I mean my own stupidity, right? So I think a, a core tenet of investing and trading for sure, but also investing is about a certain level of humility. And so you always have to kind of second guess yourself. Of course, you have to follow your instinct and also put a ticket when you feel like there's a strong narrative or something you're really passionate about or that you can see a long-term uh, appreciation trend. Um, but the fact that I'm a bit getting excited and euphoric, if anything, it would make me a little bit more risk averse rather than a risk taker, if that makes sense. Um, but that being said, I'll, I'll kind of reiterate my portfolio to, to clarify for the people that didn't hear the first time. But so my portfolio is about 70% Bitcoin, 15% Ethereum, and then the rest is still an allocation that I put into token projects that I have a lot of conviction for, or that I think have just a lot of upside potential, or just that I really want to trade for the fun of it because I need to keep my sanity and because I'm looking at markets every day and I'm talking to so many people in the crypto space, right? But you can see from the ratios that even with those allocations, we're like 10, 15% essentially, right? Of stuff that I would trade a bit more actively or that I would be a bit more degen on in terms of like the market cap of the coin and so on. It's still a very, very small per, uh, percentage. 
Now, the thing that I did in this cycle, because I was anticipating the ETF and I'm still so hardcore bullish, you know, on crypto long term is I actually didn't rebalance. So I didn't change my Bitcoin holding. I didn't change my Ethereum holding, but I did add a little bit of fresh capital. And some of that fresh capital was going to my core portfolio, which is averaging into Bitcoin and Ethereum because I was thinking ETF and I want to get exposure to that. Um, but some of it also went into some lower cap coins. Um, but that I do there with the expectation that, hey, maybe it goes to zero. And if it does, you know, you gambled a bit and you lost a bit, but it's not financially, um, it's not going to hurt yourself financially. Like sometimes, you know, people will show me their portfolio asking for, hey, what do you think about this? And I look at the portfolio and there's like 30 coins and I have never heard of a single coin that they hold, you know, I'm like, I, I don't want to, I hope I don't come across as arrogant, but if you've got someone who's been in the crypto space for six or seven years that doesn't recognize any of the coins you have in your portfolio, you went way too far out into the risk curve. Basically, it doesn't mean you're not going to make money because yeah. you, you got to stay open-minded, right? Just like in the yeah. way that we bought into Bitcoin and people were like, oh, this is probably a scam. I don't know. Maybe there's the next amazing, you know, coin that, that you're going to, um, that is going to, to pump. But the thing is, the one mistake that I can say is you should still have some Bitcoin or Ethereum in your crypto portfolio if you want a crypto exposure. You can't have only shit coins. Excuse my uh, my French, you know, but I think we say that affectionately. But it's like if it's too low market cap, you have to be careful. So no, I haven't really changed my portfolio uh, structure. The only thing is I've added a bit more fresh capital and I use some of that fresh capital to trade uh, some smaller coins that I'm excited about because there's the right narratives or, or, or the right dynamic, basically, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, so you say, you know, you look for for altcoins that you have conviction in. So what do you look for? Sure. Yeah, so, so I'll tell you, I'll I'll reiterate, let's say, the, the disclaimer in the sense that, again, when I talk about those, they're, they're really just my views because, of course, I'm in touch with a lot of people in the space, whether it's VC or foundations or accelerators or exchanges and so on. But it has nothing to do with necessarily my company's view or my company's activity because I'm at a market making firm, so it's, it's totally market neutral, right? But th there are some trends basically that I keep hearing over and over again. And I think for the patient investor, that's actually the best way to trade is like, instead of jumping on the thing that, you know, you've just seen a, a Twitter thread and you want to buy it right away, take a step back. What about if you listen and you hear a second time? Ah, okay. So now it's just not one, you know, Twitter thread. It's this plus a guy who told me about it. And then it's a third one where there's like a report from a, a data analytics team that's making research on that project. Now you start thinking, okay, third time I've been hearing about it. I feel like there's something about it, but I'm still early enough and I maybe want to get allocation to it. So in terms of the stuff that I'm looking at, in terms of the trends, so I can maybe save a little bit of time in, in terms of like stuff that I've been hearing multiple time. I think Bitcoin layer two uh, stuff is definitely a trend that, that you're seeing, right? The number of VCs, angel investors, large investors, high net worth, and so on, that are kind of wanting to ride the momentum of the Bitcoin ETF and so are bullish on Bitcoin, but also wanting to get allocation to some maybe more upside. They'll do that through the Bitcoin adjacent um, pr projects, right? Um, again, not financial advice, but just names, you know, that I'm thinking of. Stacks, which is definitely not new, but it's it's one of those more famous uh, L2s on Bitcoin. There's also Velar, which is a project that I'm kind of excited about. There's also Liquid. So all those things, there are no names, but people who would allocate to them would be thinking, okay, Bitcoin is going to grow. People are excited about that ecosystem. If they're building something to make it more scalable, that's something to get exposure to and they'll put a ticket. And so I think if you can ride that, maybe there's something to be done uh, there. The other one that I kind of hate that that I'm thinking of, but again, it's because I've heard it so many times that I think it's an actual thing that people are looking at is um, AI linked cryptocurrencies and project. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality of, of it is, I don't think there's anything real of substance within the AI linked crypto projects, I think it's it's still great, right? It's still good that they're building stuff and they're getting started out. But my point is, I think it's gonna take a lot of time before you have an actually useful crypto linked AI stuff that is used by a, a big network, basically. I think it's gonna take a long time. That being said, we need to get started somewhere and maybe that's the stage we're at, right? And so in, in that sense, there's some tokens that I'm looking at, uh, one that's called PAL, P-A-L, 
P-A-A-L, uh, or Akash Network, or Fetch, or Render. And I think all those ones are like AI related or adjacent. I won't talk about WorldCoin because otherwise I'll be very negative and, and it's not my thing. But those th that coin is also kind of linked to AI because of OpenAI and or the CEO, uh, Sam, and, and, and the link there. But it makes sense, right? There's a lot of people excited about AI in 2023, 2024, and probably 2025 and moving forward. There are people excited about crypto. You put the two together and it's going to, it's going to make sense, right? Um, the other few things, if I can do like a rapid fire stuff of, of things that I'm looking at is um, I think meme coin. Again, you can, you can see the type of investor I am. It's not really my jam. But the number of meme coin that I'm seeing pop up and exchanges looking at and taking those projects seriously because there's a community behind it and people wanting to trade it is, is kind of noteworthy. And I'll share like a quick anecdote, but there's a friend who told me something that I absolutely love. He was like, oh, I actually like meme coin. I was like, oh, why do you like meme coin? And then he said very sincerely, I think there's a certain honesty to meme coins. In the sense that it doesn't pretend like it's doing something, you know, it's like it maybe has a, almost like an opposition of the AI things like, oh, we're AI and crypto, we're going to revolutionize the world. A meme coin is just like, I'm a meme. There's nothing else behind it. But if you like the meme, trade the meme and, and go with the meme community, right? I'm like, actually, I kind of get it. You know, it's like it's still for, for me, it's still a greater fool type of uh, scenario where someone is going to be left holding the bag and some people will have e exited and dumped, you know, on, on the other ones. But, it, but if you're into that, and if you're aware, and if you're into the community, maybe there's something to be done there. And there's people who made a fortune, right, on the Dogecoin, the uh, Shiba, uh, the Pepe, and, and all that stuff, right? So, so there's something. Another maybe last note that I would make is I think a lot of people have stopped looking at NFTs recently. And I'm not a huge fan of NFT either. You, you can see I'm like a, a grumpy old man in, in the crypto space. But the truth is, when people stop looking at something, it actually makes me want to look at it a little bit more, if you know what I mean. You know, like you want to, you want to be bullish when people are bearish and you want to be bearish when people are um, bearish when people are bullish. It's like NFTs was such a craze a while back and it brought in so many investors. I don't know if you remember like 2021 and, and early 2022, but like even people that had never even heard about crypto, like didn't know what Cardano or Polkadot was, they would still... Um, they would still look at NFT and make money with NFT. And I think it brought a lot of people into the crypto space to have like a, a warm wallet like MetaMask and going on OpenSea and trying to do stuff and so on. And I feel like people were burned so hard on NFT, some, not all, that people stopped looking at it. I think it might be worth looking at it. If you're an NFT guy or an NFT gal, sorry, I would say pay attention to it a little bit because there might be upside with the quality projects that will be looked at the next time the NFT trend starts. I don't know if it will start at all or if it does when, but I, I think it's something to look at. Um, and then maybe the, the very last one, and then I'll stop talking about my, my predictions in terms of trends and so on. But I think there's a lot of, um, of farming, basically, of, of coin farming on those uh, projects that are going to launch. So they don't have a token, but they will. people suspect they will launch you know, later this year. Um, for an example of that, for example, was Starknet, but it just launched literally last week. Um, but there's also Agon Layer, there's also Scroll, there's Tyco Labs, there's Monad, ZK Sync, Shardium. You know, there's like a lot of names that you've seen all across Twitter. And you know that there's an actual community that's already excited about those guys, even though they don't have a token. So there's no question of number go up, even though, of course, when people invest, they will hope for that. But it's not even there yet. And you know there's a token that's coming at some point, right? Might be in the next six months, 12 months, 18 months. If you've got an opportunity to use that network and make some, you know, get some airdrop, the, the airdrop farming that I was mentioning uh, before, maybe that. I mean, I, I've never had much experience with like, you know, points farming myself, but it's like, I mean, is it worth the time? Would you say? I, I think it, that in itself is a gamble because if you think about what that trade is, the, the airdrop farming, there's no trade, there's no downside risk really in terms of price, price performance because essentially you're getting the tokens without really putting capital up and, and you're just waiting for the upside. Now, the truth is you never get anything for nothing. There is actually a cost, right? Which is first, maybe the time burden, uh, maybe the capital allocation, maybe the transaction fee when you're bridging in and out or, or making transactions and that. 
And so there, I don't have an answer. Uh, I'm not even saying that I'm doing much of that airdrop farming myself, but I'm just saying, if you think there are some projects that you're particularly excited about because it matches the narrative you think is going to do well, and you know they're big enough that people are talking about it ahead of time, it might be worth doing a few transactions here and there, as long as the transaction costs and the bridging costs aren't too high, because the, the flip side of that is actually there's massive upside. Uh, maybe on that point, because you're, you're asking me a bit more detail on that is, I think there's also a certain number of platforms that will let you earn points. So they're not giving you like an airdrop per se, but they're saying, oh, we're a new DEX on whatever, you know, uh, network, like it's on base. And if you trade with us, you're getting so many points for X number of volume that you're doing. I think those people are still worth looking at, right? Because if the cost of transacting and trading isn't too high, especially if you were going to trade anyway, so the transaction cost was going to happen anyway, and you're getting points, if the project does do well, maybe the majority won't, but those that do, you're getting free allocation into something like right from the beginning, like even before what a private sale or public sale or listing, you know, would look like. That's something that would excite me a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, to finish off, do you have any, you know, tips for navigating the upcoming months? Sure. So it will be a case of almost like do as I say, not as I do, because I, I think I've got a pretty decent portfolio already. But the one thing I would say is I wouldn't feel comfortable not having a crypto portfolio in 2024, 2025, not financial advice, of course. But I'm just saying, if you're looking at the markets and you see all the different things that are happening, there's really space for upside. And I think what's interesting with this cycle, even more so than the previous cycle is, I think there's even a strong upside for the, the large market cap coins. So like in the previous cycles, when you wanted to outperform, you really had to go into the lower market cap altcoins to get that massive upside. And, and sometimes you did, and so it plays out well, right? But I think even in the cycle, just the Bitcoin and the Ethereum, if there's really a lot of flow that goes into it, it's, it's going to do very well. And, and you don't even need to take like more risk with those lower market cap coins. But if you do, you're also welcome to, to do that, right? But I just feel like all around, there's a certain enthusiasm for risk assets, not even just crypto, just because of all the stuff, you know, that I've talked about previously. And so in that sense, I think having an allocation to crypto just makes sense. And either it can be done conservatively over time, like I think you you were mentioning, you know, that you were averaging into the asset, or you can even have like some bot, you know, that just averages for you on a daily basis, you know, on different platforms um, or, or different algo bot uh, third party companies. I think that's a way to get allocation. If you're already allocated, again, do as I say, not as I do, maybe go a bit more aggressive on the altcoin uh, side of, the, of that. Because of course, an interesting dynamic is all those uh, ETF flows, they're buying Bitcoin from people that are already holding Bitcoin, right? So those are crypto investors that were holding Bitcoin that accepted to sell Bitcoin. Now they have fresh capital. What are they going to do with that capital? Cycle into the next narrative that they think of, right? So there's still, even if it's a spot Bitcoin and Ethereum ETF, let's say the two things that people are looking at for uh, now, there's still a lot of upside for all the other altcoins if Bitcoin and Ethereum do well, basically. And I think they will, right? So so I think that if we're looking a bit further ahead, I would say if you have your portfolio, look for indicators of euphoria or too much enthusiasm. And those are not too hard to spot. So if you're looking at on-chain analytics, uh, I'm thinking of, of things like, I don't know if you know uh, Glassnode or CryptoQuant or Dune Analytics or Messari or look into Bitcoin and so on. Even without getting to the super technical stuff, you still typically have like cycle indicators that show you based on previous cycle when you're getting overheated, even above like a, a moving average multiplier or a major multiple or risk reserve indicator. I'm kind of showing off here the jargon, but the point is there are a lot of indicators where you can see when things are getting a bit out of work or a bit too far below. And, and you could have actually kind of timed the bottom of the market if you were looking at those indicators, you know, well enough. So I think you have to look for those, but this time on the upside and when it gets too heated, the thing to do, which I, I'm kind of like, set myself on doing for this cycle once you get to the euphoric state all the altcoins are going to bitcoin all of it like it's not even like 10 percent, 15 no more like if you're at super heated level sell all the altcoins 
fully into Bitcoin, and then maybe you shave off a little bit here and there, you know, to get into US dollar, or you sell your whole position if that's your thing, not, not my thing, but if it's your thing, go for it. But I think you need to de-risk as much as possible when you start to see the euphoria, and even probably just pay your initial capital back, so at least you're in it for free, right? And then you care a bit less if it goes up and down. The last two things I would mention in terms of preparing for the, the year ahead is, uh, or, or the future uh, in terms of, of trading, First is be ready for volatility, because I think humans, they like to think in binary terms. Oh, I'm buying Bitcoin because I think things are going to go up. Oh, I'm selling because I think things are going to go down. Well, yeah, but no, right? Like, yes, but also there's a lot of things that can happen along the way. Mm -hmm. So you can still be bullish Bitcoin, like I am very bullish and still say, hey, guys, watch out. You might have a lot of volatility in markets. You might have drops of 30 percent. No, 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 it's not possible. Everybody's bullish on Bitcoin. You know what? When everybody starts to say that it's not possible to go down 30%, that's when you go down 30%. You know what I mean? Because actually when, when everybody thinks that you can't go down, that's when everybody's leveraged long. And that's the moment when something might happen. I have no idea what, right? The canal Suez get blocked by another boat. There's, you know, some war declaration between Venezuela and, you know, another something. Markets go down and everybody gets liquidated and pushed all the way back down, right? Is that problematic long term? Absolutely not. For the hodler like you and I, okay, all good. For the trader that was thinking it was going to be blue sky sailing from 50K to 100K, that's a bad surprise, right? And so you, you have to be ready for the volatility. And on that note, and that's the last thing I would say, you know, with regards to, to that question is, and, and I alluded to it already a bit, but the ETF, it's a very good thing. It's a lot of inflows. But something to remember, it doesn't trade during the weekend. It doesn't trade outside of regular trading hours. So it always has to play catch up with crypto markets that are 24 seven. If there is something dramatic that happens in crypto markets, let's say during a Sunday at 3 a.m., watch out for the Monday morning because some people are gonna be, some, some people have to sell Bitcoin, right? They have to rebalance their ETF. Things are gonna get e even worse. So it, it's almost like m uh, amplifying uh, or multiplying the effect of market moves because now you have more and more capital and it makes the whole market a bit more liquid and so less volatile. But it also means that when there is a volatile event, despite that, then things get e even more uh, precarious, basically. Yeah, amazing. Thank you for your views. Um, thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give us a like, comment and subscribe. Thanks, Justin. And I'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks, guys. It was a pleasure.